Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to show number 185 of the Arc Junkies podcast. Today's guest is none other than the weld scientist, Mr. Nate Bowman. Today we check in to see what Nate's been up to, talk about the progress of his mobile welding lab, discuss some deposition rates, talk about Lincoln's new hyperfill process, and much more. We'll kick the show off right after these announcements from the supporters of today's show. Today's episode of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by Fronius USA. And right now, they're running their dip into summer promo, where you can get an instant $600 rebate when you buy a Magic Wave 230i in either air-cooled or water-cooled, along with a Bluetooth accessory. You can choose from the Visor Connect welding helmet or the wireless foot pedal. The Fronius Magic Wave 230i ACDC air-cooled TIG machine is another huge step forward in the welding industry. Fronius brings their state-of-the-art welding technology to a brand new ACDC air-cooled TIG welder. Every time Fronius comes out with a new machine, a new standard is set and the world of welding takes a huge technological leap forward. This machine is no exception to that and we know you'll be impressed. The dip into summer sales promo is only available now until September 30th, so you still have time to take advantage of this awesome deal. We're also brought to you by Rock Mount Research and Alloys. Rock Mount makes some of the coolest electrodes you never knew existed. Check out their website, rockmountwelding.com, and review their full list of consumables to include specialty welding rods and wires for dissimilar metals, cast steels and cast irons, special alloys, and even rods for unidentifiable steels. They also have a full line of hard facing and surfacing products to protect, rebuild, and repair all of those attachments to keep them from wearing down. And while you're there, check out their section of burr bits, grinding discs, drill bits, and saw blades. And now, Rock Mounts made it even easier to get their products delivered to your business. Hop on over to mscdirect.com and purchase your Rock Mount products directly through their website and get free shipping on all orders of the Rock Mount products. We're also brought to you by Everlast Welders. Everlast makes machines to fit every budget and every skill level. It doesn't matter if you're new to welding or you've been doing this stuff for 20 years. Everlast has a machine that's right for you. Whether you're into stick, MIG, or TIG, or even if you're looking for a solid multi-process machine because you do a little bit of everything, or maybe you just need a new torch, or you're looking to get a wireless foot pedal for a machine you already have. Everlast has you covered. They even offer financing on some of their equipment with approved credit. You can get your side hustle up and going today with a new Lightning MTS-225 and a plasma cutter. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to everlastwelders.com today and pick up your next or first machine. And as always, if you buy any machine that comes with a stock foot pedal, use the code word ARCJUNKIES in the comment section at checkout and get that free Nova foot pedal and TIG torch upgrade. We're also brought to you by the Step Wedge. The Step Wedge was created by Jameson Burt, a triple ticketed journeyman in the pipe trades and inventor and patent holder of the Step Spatterproof Wedges. He's a Canadian and he's dedicated to manufacturing high quality and innovative tools for the pipe welding industry. Step Wedges are available in three sizes, four inch, 6 inch and 8 inch so you can handle any gap on that print. The step wedges are incremental so you can handle gaps from 332 all the way up to a quarter inch. And for my friends across the pond in the UK and Australia, they also carry a metric step wedge as well. Each flat surface on the step wedge is machined to 5 thousandths of an inch tolerance and made from hardened stainless steel so it won't contaminate your exotic alloys. The spatterproof wedge is plasma nitride carbon steel making these wedges nearly indestructible. And right now, Step Wedge has a great deal for listening to the Arc Junkies podcast. When you buy any Step Wedge, use code word Arc Junkies at checkout and you can get 10% off your order. Head on over to gapintact.com right now and take advantage of this great deal. That's gapintact.com. Wedges made for professionals. All right, everyone, with Fabtech right around the corner, I wanted to give you all some information on some cool events you don't want to miss out on. On Sunday, September 12th, from 7 p.m. to 12 p.m., the Fabtech 2021 Welcome back, meet and greet, hosted by Blue Demon, Weld Porn, Outlaw Leather, Fronius, Aluma Reel, and Flame Tech will be held at the Hard Rock Cafe in Chicago. On Tuesday afternoon, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., you can stop by the CK Worldwide booth for their Meet Their Pros event. And then on Tuesday evening, from 6 to 9, you can join myself and Stephanie Hoffman at Arcs and Ales, hosted by the American Welding Society at the Northman Beer and Cider Garden. You can RSVP for this event by going to pages.aws.org backslash arcs and ales and then you can join me monday tuesday and wednesday at the aws booth 30 minutes after the show opens for a live episode of the arc junkies podcast followed by a meet and greet joining me monday i'm going to have the weld scientist nate bowman on tuesday i'll be chatting with rush kane from kane industries and then on wednesdays i'll be chatting it up with sean flotman aka dabs wellington right after the recording we'll have a session for a meet and greet i'll see y'all in chicago all right you know what time it is Fire up your machines, 
drop your hood, and turn me up five. You're listening to the Arc Junkies Podcast. Helping you make every weld better than your last with each episode. And now your host, Jason Becker. All right, Nate Bowman, man, how the hell you been? Dude, I've been good, man. It's good to catch up again. I know it's it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. What I don't even remember what uh, what we talked about the last time. I, I think, think is the last one the must be nice one. No, I think <laughs> the last time I had you on. Well, it was before that. It was it must be nice. Uh, but right after that, right after we kicked off the new year with uh, you and Kane and I, we talked about you know branding. Oh yeah, and yeah, dude, right. since since we talked that's about right. that, like it's been a reoccurring issue in a lot of the episodes, just talking about people's signatures people's brands and stuff like that Mm -hmm. it's important it's important man i've watched a lot of people grow um a ton over the past couple years um i mean it's it's been awesome just watching people just grind in a way and winning i love seeing people win yeah that's the that's the 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 coolest thing about this whole thing is like watching people set goals and crush them Mm -hmm. and do well and and exceed in what they're doing and succeed in life and you know just like, you know, I've said in the past, you know, like success is, it's different to everybody. You know, everybody has their own level of success and you can't base somebody else's, you know, performance and what they consider success as to what you consider success. You know, yeah. everybody thinks success is like, you know, a multi-million dollar house and a, a Tesla parked next to your Maserati, you know, and it's, it's different, you know, it's subjective, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Some people, for some pe- people, success is just like, you know, geez, I mean, even personally for me, just like, getting all my bills to the point where they're on like auto pay and I don't have to like be like moving funds around to be able to pay my bills. That's a nice feeling, isn't it? I mean, you know, like that, I mean, it seems, seems simple, but you know, like the, that's just the reality of how it is for, you know, a lot of people, especially people coming up in the trades and things like that. It just, um, if you own it, your own business, not getting paid on Friday when you're expecting to get paid on Friday and then, you know, you got that car payment, you got your mortgage, you got your phone bill or whatever that is like, um, you know, that's tough for a lot of folks. And you know, that was a battle that I fought for a really long time. Yeah. That was, I worked for a company and and payday was supposed to be on Monday, which, which was weird. And I asked them, I was like, why do you guys pay on Monday instead of on Friday? They're like, well, if we pay you on Friday, we've, we've noticed that we, we pay people on Friday. They don't show up to work on Monday. Cause they, they piss away. I mean, like I was doing structural steel iron work for a non-union company, man. It was like, Oh, that's that was, that was the reality of it. If we pay you on Friday, you're yeah. probably not going to show up on Monday, but I need you here on Monday. So that's when I'm going to pay you. And if I got your paycheck, you're damn sure going to be here. I'm, nobody's going to lay out on Monday. Nobody lays out that's on true. payday, you know, but it, it sucked. Cause we got to a point with them, like right around 2007 to where like, okay, you know, it's, it's Monday, it's payday. And either I would get the check or, you know, they, they wouldn't show up to the job site. They'd be like, Hey, yeah, we're on our way. And like, wouldn't see them till Wednesday. And it's like, man, I can't, we can't be having this or they, or they would, you know, they give me the check and they'd be like, okay, you you can't cash it till Wednesday. And it's like, dude, I've been waiting on this check since, you know, last week, not only is it late, but I, it's already late, you know, and I've, I've got things, I had things set up on auto pay. Like I'm already in the hole in my bank account. And I mean, this was back in shit like 2007. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I I Mm -hmm. can completely relate. You know, it's, it's nice to have things on auto pay or just to be able to bust out the debit card and pay for things, you know, without having to check the account first. Um, Oh yeah. But I mean, that's something that we all work towards and strive to be. I mean, I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm, I'm living pretty decent. Yeah. Me either. Me either, man. Just, you know, I work seven days a week still. That's, Um, that's the thing is you've got to put the effort, you got to put the time in and you got to set yourself up for success. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, that's the, you know, we were, I was talk, talking to one of my friends, this guy that um, he owns an excavation company, this guy that I've been doing some work on the side with. Um, you know, I met him about five years ago and he had, um, had just, he bought a 305 cat excavator, used one, um, and he just kind of started this out. And this is like five years ago. 
Um, last year, his business did three million. This year, he's already done ten. Damn. So you know, and he's thirty six years old, and you know, it's it's been so cool to watch him just build this business. And he just bought, I think he bought three new excavators this past year. Um, he bought a two forty five, he bought a sixty, and he bought a seventeen just to have at his house. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, it's just cool. Like this guy's only a couple of years older than I am, and um, you know, passionate about, you know, working hard, work seven days a week, doesn't live in a mansion, you know, but makes, you know, millions of dollars a year, but takes that money and puts it right back into his business, invests in his equipment, invests in his property. You know, he's building a big ass shop and, you know, it, it's, those are the kind of people that, that I like to surround myself with. And we were talking the other day, I mean, and you know, if somebody just gave either one of us a million dollars, you know, I was just telling him, I'm like, dude, I'm like, if I had a million dollars, I'm like, I'd buy it another excavator. And he's like, yeah, me too. I'm like, that's what I want to do. Um, but it, and, I think that's the thing is like, he's setting himself up for success. Cause like you said, you know, he went from $3 million the first year to $10 million. And he didn't, he didn't take that and go buy a speedboat and a mansion and a yacht and a helicopter and like all this other stuff. He went out and he put, he bought five or six new pieces of equipment to reinvest back into the company. Like I was having a conversation yeah. the other week with with Sam Hackman, and that's exactly what he did. Is he would he would buy this tool to get this job done, and then he'd buy that tool to get the next job done. He'd take that money, you know, you got to pay your bills, you got to live, you got to buy food and all that. But then you take that that extra money, and you don't go hog wild, you don't go blow that money on vacations and stuff. He reinvested it back into the company, and now he's expanded his shop. And I can see probably within the next year, he's probably going to expand again and buy more tools and. He's incorporating a CNC plasma cutter. So you're reinvesting these things and it, it sucks to have that kind of money and put it back in and buy tools now. But in five to 10 years later, when you're, when the, when the business or the company is right where you want it, then you can sit back. Now we can go to Jamaica. Now we can fly out to Paris and like, you know, do all these other things that, you know, we, we put off and postpone to get the, get the business up and running or, you know, set ourselves up for success. Yeah, that's been, you know, perfect example would be like, um, I mean, I don't know, for me, like my, my job at Central Welding, like my, you know, make enough money here that I can like pay my bills, have enough money to, um, I was able to buy that mini excavator this past year. And that was, um, you know, I still have to pay for that every month. Fortunately, I got um, had zero like zero percent interest financing on those, um, and I was like, "Well, if I get approved for this, like I'm gonna make the, this move." And to me, you know, like I pay on this thing every month, and that's like my investment in learning how to become an operator, rather than, you know, like there's there just isn't any other way to to like learn without putting yourself in the seat and actually doing it. Now, I mean, I can use it around the house and use it for other stuff, but I don't have like a construction, you know, like a business license or any of that stuff to do construction or whatever. Um, so this is just strictly for personal use. You know, maybe you go over to your buddy's house and do a little bit of work here and there. Um, but to me, I've looked at that as like, if I went to a school to be an operator, how much would it cost me to go to a school to be an operator? How much you know, and, and at that point, what am I getting out of it? How much, you know, how much time am I getting out of it? What sort of connections am I getting out of it? And to me, that was just an investment in, you know, in a few years, this thing will be paid off if I don't pay it off sooner. Um, but the skills that I learned by putting that money, you know, in that place rather than, I mean, I've been dying to get a Porsche. I really want to buy a Porsche and I drive a ton for work. I mean, I drive 40, 50,000 miles a year on average. And not saying that I would drive it every single day, but I really love driving and I've always wanted a Porsche. The excavator is very similar in price to what the Porsche would cost. Yeah, that's your Porsche. And it, yeah, definitely like, you know, it's definitely like, man, you know, I could have this, but it's like you said, it's more about making the investment in the thing that's going to get you further later because down the road, you know, here we here I've had my machine for let's say I've had it for probably like six months or so, and my my buddy Jesse that owns this excavation company, um, you know, he'll call me if he's got a guy out or something like that. Hey man, I need you to come just load trucks for me today. 
Um, and if it fits into my schedule with work, I'll take the sick day or take a vacation day or, or something like that, or we can plan it or whatever. Um, and that's what I use my, that's what I use my sick and my vacation time for at central is I'll take the time off. Um, I won't be on vacation. I won't be at the beach. I'll be doing some other work, some other place. Um, and you know, I, to me, that's, that's been the best way to get ahead. Um, and plus it's super fun. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's about the most fun thing that you can learn how to do. That's, <laughs> you I, know? I can completely relate to that. I, I, I came back to, uh, you know, from working full time over weld.com back to the school full time. And, uh, I used up all my vacation time last year, <clears throat> making trips out to Houston, you know, to meet up with the guys from, uh, outlaw leather and you yeah. know, going to, uh, Des Moines, Iowa to meet up with, uh, with crew collaborative and like going here and, and going to this event and taking a day off and, and going to judge a welding competition. And it's like that stuff that I, f- I find it really fun, fascinating and interesting, but it's, it's personal. That's kind of like, that's for arc junkies and it's for me. It's not for the school. Um, you know, I'm probably gonna end up taking some vacation time to go up to Fabtech. You know, it's just kind of the, the lay of the land, you know, and then I've got like a, a boxing event out in, I think it's October, uh, out in Houston. Uh, we're going to mm-hmm. do an automation versus, um, uh, like non-automated. So manual welding versus automation in a boxing ring down there in Houston. And I'm going to be like, I'm going to be the referee. Uh, and so we're going to have some people over here that are like for automation and some people over here that are for manual welding. And it's going to be like, kind of like the clash of, you know, who's the best kind of like a box it out type deal. And, um, it's a shame. It's just thing. weld time. Yeah. It, well, it, it's yeah, just, well, it's going to be time and quality. Yeah. Well, well time quality set up, uh, cost effectiveness, all this other stuff. But then right after that, it's going to be a, uh, there's going to be a live boxing match. And apparently this is the same place that Muhammad or Muhammad Ali trained in back in the day. But oh, I'm nice. going to, I'm going to take right. vacation for that because that's something that's not related to my current occupation or my current job with my current employer. So I've got to take time off to do that. But I mean, once again, I'm investing in myself, something that's interesting to me it's kind of a, a side hobby and a side hustle and I, so i can see giving up vacation time to go pursue a second passion you know so like i yeah. said it's, it's paying off for you because you're out on an actual job site i seen you running the excavator and stuff the other day on your instagram yeah that's, i was in a badass. i was in a 470 um a 470 it's the biggest one i've ever run uh, my job was basically just they had a, an 800 size excavator so that's an 80 uh 80 ton excavator um, with a giant breaker on it and they're breaking up all this rock. And obviously if it has just the breaker on it, it can't move all the rock out of the way once it's broken it. So my job was to move all the rock, rock up onto this upper deck where they could load it out into the trucks and get rid of it and then keep the, you know, the area where the tracks are underneath the excavator and that whole area around that, um, you know, clean so that the guy operating that machine can, um, you know, just keep breaking away at the rock. Mm-hmm. So you have a, you know, I'm in a machine that's, you know, 47 tons. Um, and he's in a machine that's 80 tons. You know, you can just imagine, like, I mean, you, you can't, if you touch the two of those together, I mean, you could just cause, a like, lot of you damage. could destroy something, you know. So just getting, um, you know, being able to just get asked, just to me, like, that's everything. Like just getting the phone call, hey dude, can you come over and run this machine? And just being trusted with something that is that big and that expensive, um, you know, it really that's such a good feeling. Um, I mean, it would be you know like in the welding industry if you've been you know if you've been trying to you know break into the welding industry, you're working in a shop or something like that, and your buddy owns like a big steel you know, a big steel shop someplace and calls you up and is like, Hey man, like I need another welder to just come weld on these parts, you know, and they're critical parts and they trust your ability to be able to do that. Um, that's one of the things I I really, that's really like, I've thought about a lot with the trades. Um, when you learn a skill, that's something that can't be taken away. Yeah. Um, and I say that I think a lot on, on these podcasts, but I think about that a lot, um, and how, you know, no matter how much things suck in other parts of your life or whatever, like at least you can still weld, at least you can still 
you know, swing a hammer or do tile or, you know what I mean? Whatever, whatever your skill is, that's not something that ever goes away. And, you know, I think the trades people really kind of hold on to that. And, um, you know, it's like a good feeling. I mean, it's just something that you can always, you can always have. Yeah. Like you said, it's something that nobody can take away from you. And that's why I like encourage a lot of people like, okay, you want to go off and get a degree? Awesome. Go learn a skilled trade first because worst case scenario, you can keep doing that skilled trade. Nobody's going to take that away from you. And it's always going to be in demand. Uh, electrical yeah. plumbers. I mean, like I bitch about like if my, especially down here in Florida, if my air conditioner goes out, it's like, shit, man, it's a necessary evil. Like I know I need this thing so I can actually sleep at night because if not, it's going to be a hundred degrees in the house, like literally. And you know, yeah. I'm, I'm down here in, yeah. it's like in, in the swamp country. So it's going to be humid as hell. So I'm just going to lay in bed all night sticky. I've, I've got to pay that HVAC guy to come out at two o'clock in the morning. And I've done it before to come out and, and fix my system. And I pay him a premium to come out at that time, you know? So like if you get into HVAC, you get into welding, you're always going to have a skill that's in demand that you can charge a premium for because people need that service and they can't do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, the need for that, um, you know, need for these skilled trades is like, you know, it's getting greater and greater. I mean, and if people don't believe that that's really a thing, I mean, we've talked about this lots of times in the past, you know, like, is there a skills gap? Is it a wage gap? Is it whatever, you know, um, it's all of those things, but you know, it doesn't mean that the work doesn't need to get done still one way or the other. Um, so there's still opportunities there. And, um, I feel like, you know, if you're in school, if you're like a high school student or you're in college or you're kind of thinking about getting into the industry or just starting out in the industry, I mean, think about everybody that you know, how many people do you know are doing the same thing that you're doing? How many people do you know are, you know, getting into welding or construction or whatever? Like what, if, if no one that you know is doing it and nobody, you know, like that should be a pretty good indication that like, you know, it's going to be something that's in need. Mm -hmm. Um, automation only goes so far. I mean, you talked about this, uh, this automation versus handheld welding. Um, this is a perfect example of if you want to win the secret to this, by the way, is deposition rate. Um, is going to, that's going to be your, you're going to be your key to, to winning. If you want to beat the automation, you need to make sure, um, that the, the, what your wire feed speed is, is higher than that of the robot. And you need to nail your weld size. So we, we were talking a little bit earlier about like bringing up that position rate. And not a lot of people understand. Um, people talk about it, mm -hmm. you know, with like stick welding versus MIG welding, flex core versus solid wire, different wire diameters. So if you want to dig into deposition rate a little bit, um, we kind of talked a little bit about, I'm going to be doing a, a trip to Lincoln here next week. And I'm going to do a bunch of stuff with hyperfill, which is, I, which I thought was the king of deposition rate until I saw this other process that I didn't even know existed. Subart? It's rotating, rotating spray transfer. Apparently I've 30, 40 that. pounds an hour deposition rate. It, the contact tip spins in a circle. No, 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 no. That's, that's the, um, oh my God. Don't even get me started on that stupid spinning okay. contact tip thing. Okay. Because, so all right. Here's the deal with deposition rate. Okay. Cause this, so that, that, that thing mm -hmm. they came and pitched that the thing with the contact tip that spins yeah that makes sense if you're doing like let's say you're doing like a cladding operation where you're you're you want to put build up metal over a wider area right like you want a really wide flat puddle and you're doing like build up work mm -hmm. that i could totally see whatever they argue that like oh yeah this has higher deposition rate than another process um people will argue that like metal core has higher deposition rate than solid wire um or flex core or whatever so let's get into how like how to calculate deposition rate so if you if you take deposition rate is entirely based on your wire feed speed so the higher you turn your wire feed speed up the more wire is going to go into the uh into the weld puddle right um, 
so you have you have um let's let's use like 035 solid wire for example um so 035 solid wire at uh i'm gonna see if i can pull up some right, of my I, notes I here covered. can i close this I, or I no got, like I got you or is covered. it gonna what do you need? crash 035 I, on spray you what i said I, I got you covered what are you running 035 on spray yeah so um so 035 wire give me give me like a a, a wire feed speed that would work well for um i'm gonna send you my i'm gonna send you my deposition rate multiplier chart right now actually okay. have i sent you this not yet this is going to give you all of the information you should be able to see all this stuff i just texted it to you so you should have all this stuff and this will we'll be able to reference this here um but i believe it's 0 0.017 um, times wire feed speed and that is going to give you pounds per hour deposition rate does that make sense yeah so when you squeeze the trigger at a given wire feed speed a certain amount of wire comes out if we know how much one inch of that wire weighs as welded right like because obviously there's process efficiency in there short circuits going to be less efficient than spray transfer you know, you get a little bit of spatter or if you run like with straight CO2, you're going to get a little bit more spatter with solid wire than you would with 75, 25. So are you, are you talking one uh, inch of the actual weld wire or one inch of weld? One inch of weld wire. Okay. So we don't necessarily, you calculate deposition rate in pounds per hour and how you program a robot to make a weld, you have to calculate it based on the deposition rate and then the weld size. So determining your travel speed is like weld weight divided by deposition rate times 12. Or it's like, it's a, there's parentheses, you gotta do like one part of the formula first and then the other part. But long story short, deposition rate and wire feed speed are tied together. The higher you turn up your wire feed speed, the more, the more metal is gonna come out, the more is gonna get deposited. So that being said, um, so if you want to do some math, right? So let's do 035 wire at 200 inches a minute because that's something that everybody can understand, right? Yeah. Like everybody, everybody's welded with 035 solid wire. So what's 0 0.017 times 200? 200. Slight pause. Uh, 3.4. 3.4 pounds per hour deposition rate. So if you have a part, right, like in this like welding versus the robot battle, you have a part, it's going to require a certain amount of weld metal in order to be completely welded out, right? A certain volume of metal. Right. So if you're able to increase the rate that you deposit that metal, you can cut the weld time down. Make sense? Yeah. So... 035 solid wire at 200 inches a minute. If you're building a part, like... Let's say you, you, um, let's say, you, you know, you're billing for a job, right? Let's say you have, you know, a hundred, it's an, a job that's going to take you a week to weld this part out and you set your machine at 200 inches a minute and you just start welding at 200 inches a minute. You're putting down three, whatever, three pounds 3. an hour. 3.4 hours. Yeah. An hour, about three and a half an hour. Okay. So that's if you were welding nonstop for the entire hour. No one ever welds nonstop for an entire hour, like on average over the course of a day. Average is around, um, I believe, eight or nine minutes an hour um, is like the average, uh, what we would call operator factor. Mm -hmm. This is all certified welding supervisor stuff. Um, so if you're able to increase that deposition rate by turning your wire feed speed up, so let's say rather than 200 inches a minute, you turn that 035 short circuit up to a crispy 350 inches a minute. Um, so what's 350 times 0 0.017? You're looking at 5.95, uh, so about six pounds okay. an hour. About six pounds an hour. So at, at 350 inches a minute with your solid wire, 035 in a really crispy upper end of short circuit, you're putting down just over five pounds an hour. Um, so you can just see the difference between those two wire feed speeds if, you know, you only need to put in, you know, if you need to put a certain amount of weld in, you just reduced your weld time by whatever the difference of those two, uh, of those two are. 
So if you're trying to get paid for a job or you're, and, and you're billing out for, for the job, your time is your money. So if you can reduce the amount of time that you spend under the hood welding this because by changing your settings, you can reduce the time that it takes you to weld out the part. Mm -hmm. So let's say you can get this part in position. Let's say it's all like, let's say it's five sixteenths or quarter inch or so, and you could run spray transfer on this. Like it's all fillet welds. You can really kind of crank it up. What's 500 inches a minute times 0 0.017 with this 035? You're looking at eight and a half pounds an hour. There you go. So there's your settings between 200, 350, and 500 inches a minute. You can, if you, you can kind of understand now, like if you have like a Miller 252 or 250 amp machine, you can run 500 inches a minute, 27, 28 volts, and some 90, 10, and you can get into a spray transfer with that machine. You're around 235 to 245 amps per stow. So you have ma you're maxing out that 252. There's not any other way to put any more metal out with that machine. Mm -hmm. Like if you go, let's say you went to, um, a lot of people argue like 045 flux core. If you look at my, ch my sheet there, what's the deposition rate multiplier for 045 71 T1, like uh, a flux core? 045, you get a factor of 0.21 or 0 0.021. Okay. So it's only slightly more than solid wire because you're really only depositing just the sleeve, just the jacket, the metal yeah. part on the outside. The rest of that is powdered, you know, is like powdered flux on the inside. So most people run 035 or excuse me, 045, 71 T1, what? 300 inches a minute. So what's 300 times 0 0.021? 1,500. How many, how many inches a minute you say? 300? 300. Yeah. 6.3. 6.3 pounds an hour. So at 300 inches a minute with 045 dual shield, you're thinking that you're putting out more metal, but you could actually put down more metal and you don't have to slag anything with the exact same machine, but using 035 solid wire versus 04571T1. Right. And at 300 inches a minute, you're only at like 180, 190 amps. So not only are you going to get better, you're going to be able to weld faster with that solid wire. You're also going to get a better penetration profile and you have no slag to chip. Yeah, I was going to say, well, that and you're not getting slag in your toe because we, we've already discussed this. If <laughs> yeah, you're we, two we have about that You're going to yeah, trap exactly. slag in that toe damn near every time. I, yeah. Every Unless time. you get out of 10 position. times out of 10. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a, that, that's a pretty good basis, you know, for people to kind of understand like, okay, if you buy a machine, if you're shopping for a machine and you're, you're a shop and you're going to do any sort of welding on stuff over quarter inch, you need to be looking in a machine at 300 amps or more. Yeah. If you're buying these Miller 252s, I, I call them Miller 252s, but I mean, any 250, 280 amp machine, the maximum deposition rate that you're going to be able to get out of that machine is going to be maybe nine pounds an hour or so, you know, and that's 035 solid wire at 500, 550 inches a minute or so is going to be right around 10 pounds an hour. Mm -hmm. So if you start looking at, um, let's look at like my, my power wave, the C300, what is, um, what's, what's the deposition rate multiplier for 045 metal core? Uh, 045 metal core, you're looking at point. 0246. Okay, so 0 0.0246 times 500. So now you're talking 12.3 pounds an hour. That's as much as I can weld on my C300. So we're using we're using a little bit we're 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 messing with this a little bit. So because because the the metal core does not have a is not a solid wire it can't carry current across the full cross-sectional area of the wire. So it's going to carry right, just most jacket. of it in the jacket and some of it through the center. So you're going to have lower amperage. At 500 inches a minute, if I remember right, it's about 308 amps. That's what I measured it on my power wave. So maxed my power wave all the way out. 308 amps, 500 inches a minute is t just over just over 12 pounds an hour. Um, so 045 metal core which is flat and horizontal only 500 inches a minute 
is 12-ish, 12 pounds an hour. That's a 300 amp machine maxed out. So you can see the difference now in if you're a weld shop and you're doing production work and you're investing in a new piece of equipment, you really have to consider this deposition rate number as the output of your machine is going to determine the maximum deposition rate that you're going to be able to put out. There is absolutely no way around this. When you program that robot that those guys are going to weld against, they're going to have a wire diameter, whatever wire that they run in the robot. Um, most robots are going to run like 052, um, you know, or 116. They run large diameter wires because why would you not if you're a robot? Mm -hmm. um, you can take and figure out what the wire feed speed is on the robot as, as, as a competitor, right? Like you could say, hey, man, where are you running that wire? You could use these deposition rate multipliers, determine what the deposition rate of the robot is going to be, and then you can just, if you can, if your machine has the output, you can weld faster than the robot by running at a higher wire feed speed or using a different wire or using that, understanding how that deposition rate works to your advantage. Otherwise, there's no way that you can win. Like you can't weld faster. Like if the metal's not coming out any faster, mm -hmm. um, which is why deposition rate is so important. And that kind of leads us into hyperfill. So hyperfill's deposition rate with is is two O three five solid wires through the same contact tip going into the same puddle. So that point zero one seven is now point zero one seven times two times your wire feed speed. So I actually have a little thing that says H fill. So I already did the math on that. So you can take hyperfill and let's say we're going to run hyperfill at 500 inches a minute. So what's the multiplier for hyperfill? It should be under 70S6 there at the bottom. Okay, hyperfill, you're looking at uh, 0 0.034. Okay, so 0 0.034 times 500. Okay, you're looking at, se holy shit, 17 pounds yeah. an hour. Yes. So now you see, now you see what's happening here. This is where if you're a shop and you're doing welds on something that is, I would say three eighths thick and up and you're not using and you're not, and you're not over 10 pounds an hour, like you are throwing away 50% of your productivity probably you know, by not looking into deposition rate. If you're using 252s to weld stuff that's 3 8 thick, like you're, the most that you're ever going to be able to put down is 10 pounds an hour. Mm -hmm. And we have the technology just even in a larger machine with more output to cut your weld time down significantly by looking into solid wire and spray transfer, metal core and spray transfer, um, or just... A, you know, maybe even a seven zero T one in position flat and horizontal uh, only flex core wire. This is probably one of the easiest things that a, a shop can do to reduce their weld time. Um, and you know, I'm not saying you need to invest in a piece of hyperfill equipment, but those numbers right there really kind of show you right. how much further you can push this. Because to get even close, you'd have to run. 052 in a spray transfer at, uh, let's see, 485 inches a minute, 32 volts. Uh, you'd be kicking out 430 amps at 17.1 pounds per hour. So you'd be, you'd be pretty yeah. close to using that, but that's a, that's a 052 wire. That's a, that's a big boy wire right there. Yeah. And not to mention you, you hit on something here too, the voltage, the voltage is another part of this whole thing. This is why I've had a lot of people when I posted the hyperfill, they're like, why don't you just run a huge wire? Like, why would you bother? Uh, you know, why do you need hyperfill? You know, why do you want two wires coming out the same contact tip when you can just run a big fatty? Well, like 332 71 or excuse me, 70 T1. I actually have that, that position rate multiplier in there as well. Um, you should see 70 T1, uh, 332 uh, yep. of an inch. Yeah, 0 0.088. So, yeah, zero. What was it? 0 0.088. Yeah, that's putting some metal down. Yeah. But the problem with that is maximum single pass fillet weld, 
five sixteenths. Okay. Well, what happens if you increase your voltage? What does that do? It makes your arc taller and wider. Mm -hmm. So typically a seven zero T one will either be run with 75% argon, 25% CO2 or straight CO2, which requires yet even more voltage to, to be running. So if you're trying to put a five sixteen spillet weld in with this coat hanger size wire at 30 something volts, you're going to have arc deflection. Like when you're, I mean, if you're trying to put a 516 fillet well, then imagine the travel speed that you're going to have to, like how fast you're going to have to move in order to put that down. Mm -hmm. So with hyperfill, what they've done is they they run 9010 gas, requires less energy to ionize. They're also running a pulse program, so it's pulse. So it's decreasing, you know, your average amperage is going to be lower, so you're going to have less heat input. Less deflection. And you're going to have a... Yeah, less deflection. You're going to have a smoother transfer of the droplets across the arc because it's a controlled waveform where it's pulsing and it's shooting those droplets across the arc, you know, by using the wave. Mm -hmm. That is going to give you a lot more accuracy in putting those 516 fillet welds in. It is literally engineered to make 516 fillet welds. And that's why hyperfill is even a thing. Um, that's why they it's easier it's easier to use that than it is to use a larger diameter wire is what is like i guess what i'm getting at now, i see but, the setup you had are you running and the the contact tips got two holes in the uh right at the end of the contact tip are you running a bigger gun so i mean like um are we 500 amp water cooled gun okay so it's it's going to be a bigger gun it's pretty much the same size as a normal gun and in any any more difficult than running like a cobra it's smaller than a cobra it's just a water cooled Okay. Big gun that has just a big fatty kind of cable on it. Mm -hmm. But it's, um, the gun is, I will say the gun is a little bit to get used to, but I mean, if you're welding on le like, let's say on the, on the flip side of this, what size gun would you need to run three thirty seconds seven zero T one? Yeah, that's true. Or what, what size gun are you going to need to run that? Like, like you said, Oh five two solid wire at, you know, 480 inches a minute or, like what did you say it was like 480 inches a minute and you yeah, know it's gonna be like yeah like 485 inches a minute 32 amps yeah, it's gonna be a girthy gun because i mean you're kicking out 430 amps so you're gonna need a 500 amp gun anyway exactly especially so, if you're running any kind of pulse current because it's you're gonna have peaks in there yeah exactly so that's really the gist of of like hyperfill and, and it, it is literally engineered to make 516 fillet welds um so this is your, you know, your beam work. I think about that guy, that GMAW welding Belgium guy, my hero. That guy can just, he runs the smoothest spray transfer stuff like ever. Um, you know, so beam work, uh, anything I would say three eighths of an inch plus where you're doing clean material. I mean, I think excavator buckets, guys like, um, uh, you know, rebuilding buckets and things like that or rebuilding heavy equipment where you really just have to, you're just pouring metal in to fill in and, and get that weld, you know, weld size built up where you're putting multiple passes in. Mm -hmm. um, that's really where this, this, this system shines. And, you know, it's not for everybody, but it is for people that, like, there is technology, there's all this technology out there for people that are willing to push the limits. And that's what, you know, I really want to kind of showcase for people to understand is, you know, you can go to the store and you can buy any machine off the shelf, but you're just buying Chevys and Fords and Toyotas and whatever. If you start looking into some of this other equipment, like, you know, Hyperfill, you know, companies like uh, Kempany or excuse me, Kempy with the Kempy. X8, um, you know, OTC Wellbees, um, continuums from Miller, any of these advanced process machines that run, you know, different types of pulse programs where you can run very, very high wire feed speed and you're doing, you know, you're able to put more metal in. Like these are the Porsches, these are the Lamborghinis of, of welders. Fronius would be another example of those guys that, uh, that does a lot with the pulse spray transfer. But if you're, if you're not using this technology, you can't just pretend that it's not out there. Mm -hmm. It'd be like you driving around and you're like Ford F-150 and you're like, man, this is the fastest truck around. And it's like, 
dude, you don't even understand. Like they have like, you know, way better stuff out there, you know, whether you choose to use it or not, like it's, it's still, it's, it's still there. It still exists. Still exists. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there's lots of, you know, lots of places around the world that have already taken advantage of this technology. And that's really what I'm trying to, I'm going to start shifting what I'm doing. Um, not only with, uh, coming out on YouTube, but on Instagram as well, where I'm going to start showcasing a lot of using this technology in real, real world places, because you know, we have a lot of welders out there that are, are very high, you know, are very skilled and they can push a 252 to its absolute limit. No problem. Mm -hmm. But it's got a limit. Let's get, yeah, it's got a limit, you know, let's, can you imagine having somebody that's got tons and tons of skills and then you get them set up on a machine like a power wave or continuum or, you know, any Fronius OTC or whatever. And then you teach them how to do the fine tuning and all the fine adjustment. Like they can take that limit even, even further probably than even I can. Um, so I think that that's, it's just a really exciting part about the industry. I mean, this technology has been out for a while, but it's being very underutilized. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break. This segment of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by AHP Welders, which are ideal machines for students, home hobbyists, makers, and those looking to learn on their own. You can get into stick, MIG, or TIG welding right now for under a grand without having to sacrifice performance. I've used these machines several times in the past, and they perform great. Get your AHP machine today at ahpwelds.com. We're also brought to you by Stronghand Tools. Let's hop on over to stronghandtools.com backslash arcjunkies and check out all the cool, awesome equipment and tools they have to make your life as a fabricator more accurate and faster. We all know time is money and accuracy is key. So start using some tools that will help you get more accurate and increase your time in your shop life. Stop by stronghandtools.com backslash arc junkies and check out all the cool tools and innovations they have to make your life as a welder and a fabricator that much easier. All right, now let's get back into the show. And I think that a lot of that falls on employers because, like, I go, I meet up with employers all the time. And, like, I was actually impressed the other day. I went to a place over here locally in Lake County and I walked in their shop and they're doing like heavy stuff, right? Like heavy fabrication, heavy structural stuff. And I was surprised that they were using all advanced power wave systems because mm -hmm. any other company I've seen, they've, you know, they got the 252s or, you know, they've got like all this prehistoric equipment. It's like, you know, you, you guys are, are trying to crank all this stuff out and you're running like short circuit on this stuff or, you know, like talking to the structural guys, a lot of them, you know, they're working out of man baskets and man lifts and they're still running stick welding. And it's like, you, you do realize that there there's flux core wires that will not only increase, increase deposition rate, but electrode efficiency. And I, oh, I, had, yeah. I had this conversation with my students the other day. It's like, what's the electrode efficiency of, of shield of metal arc welding? Anybody want to guess? And they're new students, Isn't, so I, yeah, I kind of had to it's explain. It's like a pound or something an hour or it's something. Three, deposition rate. three to five pounds an hour, but the electrode efficiency is 60%. So that means if I buy 100 pounds of 7018 eighth inch diameter rods, 60% of those, 60% of that. So 60 pounds of that 100 pounds of, of rods that I've purchased, that's going to be converted into weld deposition. The other 40 pounds is lost in slag and stubs. And, I, and I'm not talking yeah. about people like, sticking the rod and, and chucking it and putting a new rod in there. I'm talking like burning it down to the numbers like you're supposed to. Perfect, you know, perfect, you know, hypothetical, perfect environment. If you take that 100 pounds, you burn them all down to the numbers, you're only going to burn 60% of those rods up. The other 40% is yeah. lost to slag, smoke, and rod stubs. So let's just say hypothetically it's a, it's a buck a pound. So for every $100 that I spend, I'm only getting $60 of that product. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I switch over to, you know, a flux core, I'm getting a much higher um, deposition rate, but also an electrode efficiency. And uh, like for yeah, field work. 75, 78. Yeah, it's like 75 to 75 to 80 percent. And then if we switch over to GMAW, obviously that's going to be done in a shop. But, you know, now we're talking 98, 99 percent with some of these advanced processes because everything else is just smoke and spatter. And if we can start yep. fine tuning our adjustments using pulse we're eliminating a lot of that spatter, like with rapid arc, rapid X, you know, things of that nature. So that's the problem that, that, that I've run into with employers. It's like, if you invest in some decent equipment, your welding productivity is going to go up. And that's a big thing for these companies because you're a welding company. You're a manufacturing company 
and welding is a large part of what you do, but it is the area that you invest the least in. You know, you're going to oh, yeah. go out and buy a multi-million dollar shear, uh, a laser cutter, a plasma cutter, but, you know, you're still running off this, you know, Millermatic 252 from 1997. Granted, it's, it's a good machine. It'll run, but <laughs> we've come a long way since then. You know, there's advanced processes, and you guys aren't welding, you know, you're just welding flat. You know, switch over to a spray transfer. All you have to do is swap out your gas. Yeah, I mean, they could even, you could run spray transfer on a 252 uh, all day long. Yeah. You know, 035 but wire, I, I had, like I said. I had a company that I was explaining that exact same process, and I was like, you know, if you're running 7525, you've already got the wire, you got the machine, you know, if you switch over your, your bottles to an 8515, I said, you can run that stuff in there and spray, and then you don't have to try and qualify a procedure for short circuit. It's, it's already done because you can run it and spray in the flat position. That's all you're welding in is, yep. is flat. And the, the, guess the guy's answer was, yeah, but, you know, we, we don't want to have so many different bottles lying around here, and the guy's getting confused. What the hell? Because you, they run 70. Like, oh, man, our guys can't read good, yeah. so uh, yeah, we better exactly. not go any faster. It's like, like you know, if there's a label. Is that? Yeah, there's a label on the top of each bottle that tells you what's in there and say, hey, guys, I mean, if they're that dense, like, and I told him, I said, I can come down here on a Saturday and I can give you guys a class in like 20 minutes and show you how to run both processes. And you're going to save thousands of dollars. You know, with the amount of guys you got in here, you're going to save thousands oh, yeah. off a 20 minute class. And he's like, yeah, but they'll, they'll, they'll get it confused because we run 75, 25 for all of our short circuit stuff. But then we run it again for all of our, our gas shielded flux core. And it's like, okay, it's like arguing with a freaking I-beam, man. It's, it's just not sinking in. It's like, trust your guys a little bit more, train them. They'll be worth more to you, you know, like invest in your equipment, invest in your employees. And that seems to be the the one place that employers don't want to invest in is their employees because they're afraid they're going to leave. Well, if you treat them a little bit better, if you pay them what they're worth, they're not going to leave. You're going to have a lower turnover rate. Yeah. And not only that, like imagine a guy that's putting out, you know, three to five pounds an hour and now he's putting out 10 that's basically like having two guys. Yeah. So you could pay him twice as much money and still be making the exact same amount of money on this guy because you just improved your productivity by that much. With the same machine, all you got to do is just change over the gas and change your settings. So, I mean, this is why I've waited so long to do this YouTube thing is I really want to create like this database for people to be able to just see this is the difference between this wire feed speed, that wire feed speed. Here's the time it takes you to make this size weld. This is what it looks like. Here's what you have to do in order to make these changes and make it definitive enough that, I mean, I'm sure people can argue all they want, but I know that the data is right. There's other welding engineers and people out there that will corroborate, you know, my, my, you know, whatever I'm studying Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that's really the, the goal of, of like, you know, weld scientist as the, the, U- or as the YouTube channel, as well as my social media. Like I really want to start becoming this technical resource for people to be able to, uh, to reference the information that we put out. So there's going to be a lot more of these like studies and things like that. Kind of like what we did with just this little bit of math on the podcast, by the way, all these deposition rate numbers that I that I threw you, um, in case anybody was wondering where they came from, if you look up the spec sheet for any wire that you want, literally any wire that you have, um, yeah, you like literally, yeah, exactly. That's um, so. What I did was so the process or the process efficiency for O three five changes as mm-hmm. you move up. So what I did was, and you if you calculate the deposition rate based on like the numbers that they give you on that sheet. Um, it, that dip, that position rate multiplier may change by like 0.01 right. or so like across the whole thing. So what I did was I, I calculated all of them for every single, for the, for the full range of the wire. And then I averaged them. Okay. So all my deposition rate multipliers on that sheet that I gave you are done the exact same way. So for every single different type of wire, I factor in the average um, it, it, as an average deposition uh, rate multiplier. So my numbers are actually probably a little bit more conservative rather than um, 
you know, a little bit over the top. Right. So for those that, that can't see, obviously it's a podcast, it's audio. I knew Nate was going to be on the podcast. I knew we were going to talk about deposition rates. So I busted out my, uh, my C1.10 uh, Lincoln Electric Consumables book because I know Nate's a fan of the L56 wires and all that. So I, I want to follow along because I'm a visual guy. So I'll like, once again, these are, these are free books, the free PDFs. I'm not plugging Lincoln. You can get them for Lincoln, Miller, Esob, whoever. Uh, I pulled some stuff up for uh, Blue Demon the other day trying to help a guy out on some, um, some gas shield of flux core wire. You can pull up the, the, the make and model of the wire that you're running or the specification classification on Google. Type in .pdf after it, and it'll give you a spec sheet. and It'll, it'll roughly tell you deposition rates, gas composition that's recommended, uh, contact tip to work distance, uh, approximate uh, amperage based off of the wire feed speed and voltage that they're giving you. And it's all, it's all yeah. free. Free resources. Go out there and get it. Yeah, all this stuff is like, this is not... This is this is not. Uh, it's, it's definitely. It's not. This a is not. It's not rocket science. Yeah. This is this data is out there. Um, I would say that I'll send everybody my my deposition rate cheat sheet thing, um, but I'm not going to do that yet. I sent that page to you. That's like has all my formulas and all that stuff in there. Um, I don't think a lot of that. I haven't really kind of honed that in yet to the point where it will make sense to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, but it makes sense to you probably, oh, but yeah. you could probably plug in some of those formulas and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what um, I'm going to do with it is cause I'm, I'm horrible about reminding or remembering if things come to me and whether it's email, text message, Facebook, instant messenger, or a, um, Instagram instant message. So like Alex Siebert and the guys over blue demon sent me the, the blue demon well Bible. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to write it all down in that. So I, I don't lose it. There you go. There you go. Yeah. All those things are good. Double check the numbers to um, run them forwards and backwards. I've had a lot of um, a lot of my friends that are welding engineers and stuff that have also looked at this stuff. Mm -hmm. We've used I've used been using these numbers for, you know, since my my days of working at uh, at air gas. You had Rob Tessier. I was just going to say um, Rob Tessier has got it all. I've got it on a spreadsheet inside on a, on a little tiny thumb drive. And the formulations and calculate, I was like, where the hell do you get all this shit? And he's like, man, I've been doing this stuff for 20 years. I just put it in a format. And I was like, yep. It's freaking brilliant. Yep. And he's got, have you I, ever seen the deck of cards that he carries around? Oh, I haven't seen this. He's, he's got a deck of cards, you know, like regular, it looks literally like a deck of cards other than it doesn't have the fancy stuff on the back, but he, he's got it in a, um, a little, a small deck that he's made. He made all these, he, you know, typed them off, printed them off on an Excel spreadsheet, cut them out, laminated them, and he's got it held together with a little rubber, rubber band. And when he's sitting there chatting with you, he'll just pull this thing out and just start popping the rubber band, you know. Uh, maybe he's got a touch of ADD like I do. You know, i got to fidget with something. Uh, but inside that little deck of cards, and it's probably, there might be 52 decks or 52 cards in there, but it's, um, it's all calculations for wire feed speed, deposition, current, amperage, everything. I mean, anything you can yeah. think of related to welding, he'd be like, oh, you're running 052? And he'd like leaf through his little deck of cards and pull out a card, psh, boom, okay, yeah, you need to be running this many uh, volts, this much wire feed speed, here's your contact tip, but he's got it all right there with him. He carries yeah, that and like an old school calculator, and that's it. I keep mine I keep mine in my, in my notes on my iPhone, um, and I keep adding to it, adding to it as I do more calculations and stuff, because that's the thing. Like, once you do the math and you do the calculations, that's what it is. Like, yeah. it's not it's not going to change. Everybody wants to get really technical with welding and stuff. Like, what do you think about welding? This weird obscure metal to this and that. And it's like, dude, 99% of welding is like a 36 carbon steel, putting in fillet welds in the flat position. Mm -hmm. Why are we making this any more complicated than it has to be? There's only a handful of ways to do it. You can short circuit, you can run spray, you can run gas shielded flux core. You can run self shielded flux core. You can stick weld it. That's it. You don't need to be like, you know what I mean? What machine do you have? Like, why are you asking about some obscure process and stuff like that? Like, you know, sub arc when it's like, dude, you can't even make five sixteenths billet welds, you know, at 10 pounds an hour. Like, why are you worried about all this other weird stuff? Like it's welding. It does not have to be as complicated as people make it, but right. these formulas, these formulas and stuff that, that Rob talks about, like these have been around forever. Yeah. Um, it, and it was really nice that it was uh it was nice that you had him on the podcast. Um, 
I don't talk a lot about my time at air gas. Um, I did not leave air gas on necessarily the best of terms, um, with a guy that I worked directly for. Um, but the rest of the team of guys that I worked for, I love those guys to death. Like, um, Rob Tessier and I, um, I'll tell you a story about Rob, uh, Rob and I, um, so I got hired for air gas and I had been there maybe a week and this is like, you know, we're, we're at dinner with my boss and then Rob Tessier, who's like, if you guys don't know who Rob Tessier is, he like runs air gases, advanced fab team for like the whole world. There is not another person on this planet, probably besides myself that it like loves the technical, like welding stuff more than this guy. He like lives and breathes this stuff and is super passionate about helping the industry advance. And this is why I've never trash talked to the air gas advanced fab team. If you have an opportunity to work with any one of those guys at any time, go for it. Yeah. Like you should, uh, these are smart technical people that can help you solve your welding problems without a doubt. Um, but Rob is, he's like kind of different. I mean, if you talk to him on the podcast, like you get it, like this guy thinks about this stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week and has been doing so for years. So he's, he's arguably one of the best, if not the best at this type of stuff. Um, so we're at dinner, um, (laughs) we're at dinner at this like really fancy restaurant on the, on the Columbia river. And, uh, in Portland, there's an airport like right there along the Columbia river, PDX airport. And we're sitting at dinner. We're outside on the patio, only been working for the company, maybe a week. And these fighter jets come like screaming over the top of the thing, like that take off. And Rob looks up at them. He goes, Oh, cool. F-15s. And I'm like looking at them and I'm like, how the hell do you know that? I know. No, 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 no. So I didn't even think like I was looking at him. I'm like, nah, those are 18s books, you know? And he just like, (laughs) I didn't like, I just slipped out, you know, like this is like my boss's boss's boss. Like this is like the, one of the highest up guys at the company. And he just like makes this comment. He's like, Oh, those are F-15s. And I'm like, I'm like, no, those are 18s. And my boss like need me under the table, like kicked me in the knee under the table is like, dude, what are you doing? You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, why would you, you know, why would you say that? So I was just like, I made that comment and then I just like left it. But then Rob kept bringing it up that like he knew what he was talking about and I just couldn't leave it alone. I was like, dude, I'm like, I'm like, I, I, I was in the Air Force. I was a sheet metal fabricator. My job, like, literally is aircraft structural maintenance. Like, identifying aircraft is, like, probably one of the things that I can do best, you know? Like, of all the things that I took away from the military, like, I could tell you what plane that is just based on its silhouette, based on the vertical stabilizers, you know, based on the shape. Uh, That's just something that, like, when you work on aircraft all the time, like, that's just something that you do. So I just was like, yeah, I'm like, dude, I'm like, those are F-18s, 100%. Like, F-15s have vertical stabilizers. F-18s, vertical stabilizers are slightly tilted out. They have a longer nose, you know, whatever. And he just would not stop. So we're sitting there going through dinner, and I'm like, I just get on my phone, and I, like, just type in F-18 PDX. And there was a thing, like an article in the Columbian, which is a local newspaper, saying that, like, F-18s, you know, like look up like F 18s <laughs> flying over PDX or whatever. <laughs> like during this time, you know, like they're in doing this training thing. And I like slid the phone across the table to Rob. <laughs> and he like looks at the phone and he's like, Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> I was like, and after that, Rob and I were like tight. But the tight. funny, I could see the smirk on his face. Like, because I've talked to him several times before I had him on the podcast. Yeah. And that's why I knew. I was like, I got to get this dude on the podcast because there's very few, there's very few people like nowadays that like I just sit in awe and yeah. like as soon as they start talking, I just I hone in. Like like I've said, I've got really bad ADD, but like when you start talking, when Rob Tessier starts talking, Bill Comlos, Bill Farmer with eight with Air Gas, I'm sure you've oh, met Bill him. Bill Farmer's a legend too. Love Daryl Peterson. It's like. When these people start talking, like no matter what's going on in my life, it's like I can I can focus in on that because they start talking about like the nitty gritty of of welding, you know, they're like mm-hmm. the really finite details, and it's like okay, this is the part where I need to shut up and and just listen because this is experience that 
It's not going to come from any, anywhere else. These these guys know their shit. But, yeah, these guys. Yeah, like I went to um, I went to a, tr- a very like intense training um, with Rob uh, down in Texas and stuff. And boy, like I mean, after after this was after that event. So he had me like going first and stuff and like going up in front of the class and like he did, oh man, he just, yeah, it was, he got me good, you know, without a doubt, like just, oh yeah, Mr. Like, you know, cause I, I, you know, I'm not like a know it all, but like when I know something, I know something yeah. and I have confidence in what I know and I happen to be good at this welding stuff and I really, and I'm only good at this stuff because I love it the same way that he does. And mm-hmm. these other guys do like, I really will tell people that like, what's the secret to learning all this stuff. It's like, this is, this is my passion. You this is what I love to do. You, you can't, this is something you can't go into and just be like, I'd like to learn this. No, you, you can't go into it that way. You've got to have a love and a passion for it to sit down and, and start reading a lot of these books and having these conversations and asking the right questions. It's a lifestyle, man. It's really a lifestyle change. And, you know, at, at, at Central, I got I got recently um, moved into a new position where I'm the director of welding optimization and education for the company. So my job is to, you know, do internal training as well as training for our customers. And when I proposed this whole like, hey, we should do a team kind of thing um, or put together a group of guys that are technical, you know, people like, you know, like myself, when you know, I was asked when I kind of put this proposal together, I was like, look, I'm going to, this is on them. You know, this is a career move on the people that want the opportunity. I'm Mm -hmm. not going to call my coworkers, the guys that are on the team and ask them if they're reading their book. I don't really care if they read it or not. It doesn't affect my job one bit. Mm -hmm. You know, like these guys need to, to say, this is a, this is, I see what Nate's doing or I see what other people in the industry are doing. And these are the things that I like. Now they have the resources that, you know, what in this case it's a certified welding supervisor handbook, which is anybody that wants to learn about the stuff that we talk about on this podcast, the orange book, uh, the orange book, the sort of the, what is it? The welders manual for certified welding supervisor or something yeah. like that. It's an AWS publication. I probably have one floating around here somewhere, but, um, Maybe it's down here. I don't know. It's in this office, I'm sure, somewhere. But the the orange book is the Certified Welding Supervisor Manual. It's written by this guy, Jack Barkoff. That is, that's like the gateway drug to, to all of this stuff. It talks about welding process, deposition rate, operator factor, um, you know, weld volume, uh, calculating travel speed, how to calculate weld volume in different types of weld joints, like, that is the, and it has tests and stuff in the back of every section. Mm-hmm. Do you have the orange book? I do. Yeah, dude, that, that's it. That is the book. That's the book we got for several people that I, that, that work with me at central. Um, and there's, uh, my coworker, Brian, um, he is, um, man, what a small world, by the way, like we got to talk about Jake Lear, uh, and Rosie, uh, meeting yes. up with you guys in, yes. in Ohio. Like that's, that's going to be cool. Um, but anyways, my coworker, Brian, he's the sales guy for Jake. He's okay. The guy, he's the sales, he's Jake's sales guy. So Brian sees the things that I do and he's like, we, I want to do that stuff. How do I get there? I'm like, learn everything in this book. So Brian calls me probably once a day on average. Um, and is like, Hey, I saw this customer. They were doing this. What do you think about this? I'm like, you're on the right track. And it's Brian gets it. He's making this shift guys like, um, like Jake, um, as an instructor, he yeah. is out learning this kind of stuff so he can advance what he's doing. So you guys, so you got to meet Jake Lear. Jake Lear is probably super cool, dude. Like he's one of my favorite welding instructors, if not my favorite welding instructor that I've met, uh, in the region. Mm-hmm. Um, I met him at uh, Skills USA. Uh, the first time I went to Skills USA, Oregon, his kids worked together so well. I mean, it was night and day different. Like, I think that they all, I think that they won or played, they definitely all placed, 
but his kids work together as a team better than any other group that I saw. I mean, and it was like blatantly obvious. And I, you know, went up to him after the thing and I was like, man, I'm like, your kids are just dialed. Like, you know, anything I could do to help you out or anything like that, let me know. And he's like, uh, actually you should come down to this like welding instructor conference thing. And that was with Ryan Eubanks. Yes. And I went down and I met Ryan Eubanks. Did you finally meet Ryan? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I met, I met Ryan, um, that like right after that. So it's just so funny. It's such a small world. It is. And that, that was the funny then, thing is, cause like we were talking about, uh, you know, I was saying that I was getting ready to head up to Cleveland, Ohio to hang out with Ryan Eubank. That's where I met Jake. And then Rosie was taking the class over at Lincoln who happened to be running their seminar the same exact week. So I think it was like Monday or Tuesday. Like, and it was, it was really weird because like we were chatting via Instagram and I was like, okay, this is going to be kind of odd, but I know I've never met you and we, the only reason we know of each other is because of the same person. But if you want, I will come pick you up in, you know, uh, a, a black Jeep, and, you know, like an unmarked vehicle. Yeah, yeah. And I will, yeah. I will take you away from your safety area and, and bring you to a completely different area. Like you just have to trust me on this because we know the same guy. So it, it was like a weird exchange. It was like, um, are you yeah. cool with me yeah. coming to pick you up from school and like taking you somewhere else? Cause I know you're like up here on business, but like, Yeah, I picked her up the one day, I think it was Tuesday, and then she came over to the school. Uh, She ended up going out to dinner with us. It was was like a really cool deal, and then we dropped her off at the end of the night. But it was just like welding instructors that are passionate about teaching, getting together, learning more about welding from other welding instructors, and just having a good time. And it was, like you said, it's a small world. Rosie is, um, did she tell you her Instagram handle that she came up with? No. The weld is your oyster. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's pretty clever. So she's a um, little history on Rosie. She's a professional photographer, yeah. like has a master's degree in photography and is teaching um, photo and video at this small school in Eastern Oregon. But hold and, on, I got I to gotta stop you there because the name of the school, like I, I thought that was like just the name of the school because it's Spray Oregon. So I was like, oh, yeah. cool. That's the name of the welding school because Spray is a, you know, a, a GMAW process. No, Spray is a town in Oregon, and it's that's yeah. their school. And I was like, oh, okay. And I didn't put two and two together because I read the article that they wrote about it, about the two guys that came in and kind of helped set it up and all the work that you did over there and, like, how Rosie was yeah. taking over. And I didn't realize it was in Spray, Oregon. I thought that was just the name of the welding school. Yeah, no, no, that's the name. Yeah, that's the name of the town. There's, like, 150 people or so in this town. There's, like, 50-something people at this school. Rosie has the CTE credentials that she needs in order to be able to teach this welding program. And they just don't have anybody else to really pull from. So she had never welded ever until like the program was like just getting started. And it was never like, Oh, we're going to make Rosie this instructor. It just was like, she's like, you know, I could learn how to weld and do that. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of people would be like, man, like how is this person that's never ever welded like going to do it? Well, she went to Lincoln for two weeks Yeah. when, you know, we, I went back out there, we got a chance to hang out again and kind of go over everything that she learned. She had awesome questions about the process and why we do this and why we do that. Zero bad habits. So, you know, I think without a doubt, like she's going to be super effective as a teacher and, you know, I'm just really, really, to me, it's like, it's awesome to see other people out there that are passionate about just passing this on Mm -hmm. and they see the value in, in a skill, um, you know, like welding or, I mean, or photography for that matter, any of that stuff, like being able to, like when I became a professional photographer, like I literally did that. So I could tell the story about welding. Mm -hmm. Like it was not like, I I like photography, but that's why I did it is because I was like, you know what, with social media, the way that it is, like if my pictures are better than the next guys, if my, you know, videos are better or whatever, then I'm going to be able to reach more people and I'll be able to more accurately tell the story about what I'm trying to do. And that has been for years, like something that, that I've really, really worked on. Um, it's a skill and you know, welding is, is no different. Operating equipment is no different. It just takes time. And, uh, those three things, though, I would say, 
can't think of other things like that, but um, welding, taking photos, and running equipment are three things that you can't help but be horrible at for a while. Culinary. <laughs> like, there's no, there's no other way. Culinary or cooking. Cooking. Oh yeah, cooking. That'd be that'd yeah. be one too, stuff. man. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. But I, I think what separates it is like okay. you've, you've got to have a passion for it. You can't go in there, you can't half-ass it. You know, you got to give it the old no. uh, Ron Swanson. You got to whole-ass it. You know, like when you yeah. when you sit in there, you can't just like kind of fake it till you make it. And that's why I get these people ask all the time on social media, "Hey, should I go to school and learn how to like legitimately do it, or should I like lie on my resume, get into a shop, and just learn learn that way?" And it's like. You don't know what you're getting when you go into a shop. You know, it could be a, a crew full of people that don't know jack shit about like actual welding. Like I said, I've I've ran into structural shops and they're running short circuit MIG on half inch plate, and it's like, what the hell? Are you gonna, you're gonna death somebody, you know? <laughs> and, and I see that. Go I to see school, that too. Go to school, find a decent school, or find a good mentor that knows what the hell they're talking about before you just like, I'm just gonna fake it till I make it. I mean, unless you can get into a legit company where they hire professional welders and you can start off sweeping floors and, and grinding and prepping things. And you want to work your way up that way, have at it. But if not, I highly recommend going to school, but then find a decent school with a good instructor. And you got to find a passionate instructor. Otherwise you end up in the same situation that Christina Mahler ended up in. I was just getting ready to bring that up. You know, like um, you that was probably the situation that happened with Christina is really what sparked me to just make this decision. Like, cause I, I, I've been, I've had a lot of people ask like, man, when are you going to do YouTube? When are you going to go on YouTube? And I, I just have waited because I'm like, I don't know what I want to be on YouTube. Number one, I would rather be behind the camera. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, Phil house of chop, Phil, he's the guy that really pushed me to start doing more videos on Instagram, my stories. Mm -hmm. He's the guy who's like, Cause he would hit me, hit me up with some sort of technical question. And rather than try to like text him, I would just send him a video like, yeah. Hey man, this is how I do this or whatever. Cause it's, it's just easier to explain. And he's like, dude, you got to start doing these in your stories. And you know, I don't like the sound of my own voice on things like it. And it just like, and I'm like, man, like who wants to see what I have to say anyways. And you know, all of that stuff. And now Instagram is kind of like, I'll put stuff out in my stories and I'm just working on how to explain things. So like I'll put something out, I'll get the feedback from people that send me messages and stuff. And I'll be like, did I explain this right? Like, and that's how I'm building all my stuff for YouTube. Mm -hmm. This thing with Christina, where she was saying that like the guy just put her on welding tips and tricks or whatever it is, like as a resource, right, wrong or indifferent. It's like if schools are using YouTube as a reference thing, I want to be the person that's that that's on the screen with accurate data. That's, that's yeah. Like I, I completely, I completely get that. Cause I get messages all the time. It's like, Hey man, you know, your video on weld.com with you, you know, running this process or this position or doing this test plate. I was able to pass my test. Like I've gotten three messages in the past couple of weeks about people passing their D one, one tests, whether it was uh, stick flux core or pulse because the videos that I did with weld.com. And it's like a great ego booster, but you know, I'm just, I'm happy that I was able to help somebody out on their, on their journey through welding. But what pisses mm -hmm. me off is that's how they learn to do it. And they're in school paying somebody to teach them how to do it. <clears throat> like yeah, I, I get yeah, it. Use it, use yep. it as like, use it as like <clears throat> additional information or, you know, supporting the curriculum or here's like another method but don't use that as your core curriculum. Don't use freaking YouTube, regardless of the content, whether it's, you know, welding tips and tricks, weld.com, weld tube, all great channels. Don't use that as your core curriculum. Don't use that to teach your students how to weld. You know, like you should be doing it. And that's supplemental information. That's how you like, 100%. okay, you know, like I'm going to hit pause because this is a really good arc shot. This is what you should see in your welding hood. I can't explain it. A picture's worth a thousand words this is what your electrode should look like. This is what your puddle should look like. Here's where it's wetting out. Here's where it's tying into the toes. Use it for supplemental, but don't use that as your primary source of education. And if you are, get the hell out and let somebody else take that seat. Yeah, 100%. Oh. And like that, like I could not have said that better. My girlfriend told me 
um, she met some guy, um, one of her patients or whatever that that's going to welding school or something like that. Or, you know, it, you know, she's a physical therapist and she's, you know, this guy's like, you know, in for an injury and, you know, she's always like, Oh, you know, like, what do you do? Like that way you can kind of understand a little bit better. Like, how's this person moving, you know, whatever. Yeah. And the guy's like, Oh yeah. Like I'm in, I'm in welding school. And you know, she's like, Oh, she's like, what, you know, what's that, that like? How is, you know, how is that? And she said that this guy was like watching a lot of Bob, like Bob Moffat YouTube videos or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I'm like, no, like no matter what we do, like, it's just like, how, how are we paying a welding instructor at a school to show YouTube videos? Yeah. Like that is, if you're a welding instructor, like, I'm not saying don't show the videos, but like, if that's how you're teaching, get the hell out. Stop. Like yeah. for real, you suck. And I hate you. Like, I can't, stand people that teach you're not you know what i mean like we are not getting paid to make the youtube videos Mm. we're putting it out there to like help the industry along but like you can't just can't just put that out there and that's the only way that your your students learn there's so many times that i've heard that i'm so glad that you brought that up especially being the guy in the video being like yo like and I, I mean, I get it. This. And like when I went to the welding educator thing and like, I'm, I'm still super, like it still sketches me out when people recognize me or it, it, it throws me off. Cause I don't see it as anything other than like, I, I don't know how to explain it. Like I don't see myself as famous or any of that shit, but like even at the, the instructors Institute that we went to with Ryan Eubank, people would come up to me and they're like, Hey, you know, I use your, thanks for doing the videos and stuff. I really appreciate it. I use your videos in my classroom to explain X, Y, Z. Perfect. You're doing it right. Great. It's supplemental. It's for people that aren't going to welding school or people that want to grasp a concept or additional information outside of class. Here's a different technique. But it shouldn't be your primary. Like, I mean, in Christina's case, he was like literally, okay, today we're going to learn about stick welding. And he would hit pause or he would hit play and walk out of the room until the video is over and then come back in and turn another one on and be like, okay, go out into the lab and do it. And it's like, what yeah. the hell are you? If no. you're, yeah. If you're an, if you're a student and you're in school and your instructor is doing that, you should probably look at maybe going to a different school and getting a refund. or like report your instructor for being a total freaking scumbag. Yeah. Like that's not the way that this is supposed to work. There are people out there I know and you know, that are super passionate about the welding industry and they would give their right arm to be a welding instructor at a community college or a school or something like that, like without a doubt. Yeah. And you know, it's the people that are doing shit like that, that are, it's literally holding up progress for the rest of the industry. You know, not that the videos aren't informative, not that they're not good, but like you said, these cannot be, the only thing that you're learning, like, why are you paying? Yeah. You know, when I went to at that point, you're paying for access to the equipment or 15 grand. Yeah. Like I'm not going to pay 10 or $15,000 to watch YouTube. Like, no, no. at at that point, I'm glad that you said that. That's like, at that point you're paying for access to use the equipment and the materials. You're not paying for instruction. You can watch the same videos at the house. You can buy a small power source at the house and get you a little weld table from Harbor freight. And you can practice at the house till your heart's content. You could, Literally, for the, the cost of some of these schools that are charging for welding, and they, they call it welding education. Um, yeah, now, granted, there, could, there are some high-cost tuition schools that you're going to go in there, you're going to get a great education, and you're going to get lined up with a, a badass employer, and you're going to make great money leaving. Do your research. Read the reviews on Google. Don't read the reviews on the school's website. Read yeah, the reviews yeah. on, you know, because they pay people to write those, and I have that firsthand knowledge. I'm not throwing any names out, but um, I I do know for a fact there's schools out there that first or third day of class, they come in and they're like, all right, everybody's going to write a review on how well you enjoy this school. Uh, Everybody's going to give us a five star and you're going to write this, that, and the other thing. And they populate their entire page with five star reviews or four and a half to make it look official. But, you know, do your research. Look on Google. Don't look at the school's website for the reviews. That's like when I see a product on Amazon or Instagram or anything else, I, I don't look at the, the reviews there. Or I'm sorry, yeah. when, when, I, when I see a, a product on Instagram or Facebook or anywhere else, I'll read the reviews on Amazon because a lot of those are, they're unbiased. Those are people that actually bought the product, you know? Yeah. 
don't look at the the company's website to read the reviews. You know, go out or, or talk to somebody. You know, if you know somebody that went to that school, talk to them. Hey, was it worth the the X amount of thousands of dollars you spent to go there? Yeah, it was. Cool. Okay, that's all I needed to know. But if it's not, find another school. Yeah, my friend, my friend uh, Nick just went to the same welding school that uh, that I went to uh, way back uh, or back in New York. He just went through the same thing, and you know he messaged me like, dude, like this instructor just doesn't care. Like, doesn't like, what do I do? Like, I've already signed up. Like I got to make my way through this. And like, he's realized like, dude, he's like, I can't even find the instructor. Like, you know, he's off doing other things or he's whatever. And you know, this kid, um, he went and I told him, I'm like, you should just like any, any place that you can go knock on the door or whatever. Like just, just start trying to do that. He ended up getting a job at this place and they have a power wave and that's 500 sitting in their shop. And he's like, do you know about this machine? I'm like, <laughs> a little yeah, bit, buddy. Yeah. I'm like, I know a, little I know a bit thing or two about a thing wave. or two. So I was like, I gave him all the settings and all the weld modes and stuff. And he went in and was able to make welds that were like on the money. And because the machine runs accurately and I could tell him like, Hey, set your wire feed speed here, set your voltage here. And you can make, clean welds with these settings and meanwhile back at school he's getting pushed to get this stick welding d11 stick welding certification that the same one that i got Mm -hmm. that i've used like one time on one job and it's like man like that was you know 10 years ago like how are how is the same how is the school still pushing these d11 structural steel stick welding certifications when you know we we did a study at cent or at, at central i had my area sales manager um look at what the ratio of wire to electrode is or like how much wire are we selling in an area versus stick electrode cuz i mean <laughs> it'll blow that your damn should mind, ref- won't it? that should reflect <sighs> what you're teaching you know what i mean in the schools like if there's and, and it was like 80% it was like 80% um MIG welding electrode and then like, you know, 15% TIG and then 5% uh, stick welding yeah. or stick electrode in this certain area. Yet you go to the school and probably most of that 5% of, of electrode that's getting purchased in that area it's is going the to the damn school. Yeah, And it's like, dude, so if you're spending all this time teaching kids how to stick weld, um, and then they go out to, you know, to get a job someplace and all their experience they have is with stick welding and there's not a stick welder even in that shop. Like how prepared is that student really for, for the thing? Now on the flip side, you've got a school like Spray Oregon. I talked to, I was talking to, to Rosie about this. It's like, you know, I would actually spend a little bit more time on stick welding because, you know, as an, as a student leaving this program, the likelihood of them encountering a MIG welder out on a farm someplace is a lot less than them, you know, seeing a stick welder. Mm -hmm. If they see a stick welder and they know how to set the machine and they see, okay, this is a eighth inch 7018 or eighth inch 6010 or whatever. Like if they can identify the electrode and they understand where to set the machine, they can, they could fire that machine up and make a weld. And that is, probably like that that could be their foot in the door right at at a ranch or at at whatever and that kind of stuff is really important so you really have to um you know as an instructor look at where the students potentially are going to work and what things that they might encounter like once they leave your school and like you want to set them up with the skills that they need to operate whatever equipment is in their area um you know if you live on the coast like stainless steel and aluminum. Like you guys should be teaching that kind of stuff. If you live anywhere near a body of water, because yeah. boats and stainless and, you know, aluminum, and like all, all that, that stuff shit. go yeah. together. That's I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it was probably a couple months ago. I went down to treasure coast community college. They were doing a welding competition and they asked me to come out for the day and <clears throat> just kind of help be there and watch over the students and everything and just be part of the competition. And, I was talking to one of the sales reps because he works for the same company that, you know, we get all our supplies through. And that was one of the questions I asked him. I was like, Hey man, you know, just out of curiosity, how much, you know, solid wire are you selling as compared to like 7018 stick electrodes? 
He's like, oh man, it's no comparison. Like that 70S6 wire makes up like 80% of, of our hard, hard products. And, you know, stick weld, you know, all the stick welding electrodes, you know, you're probably looking at about tw- 10 to 12%. So I was like, okay, just because I want to make sure that I'm preparing my students. So if that's what the, the majority of the companies are buying, that's where my focus should be. You know, if, if obviously there's a lot more wire being, being burned up, uh, you know, on solid wire versus stick welding. However, my, my thought process is still, A, if you can learn stick welding, you can learn any other process. B, sure. if, if nobody's hiring for those stick welding or those, you know, those GMAW working in a factory, cranking out manufacturing parts, you can always fall back and get into something with stick welding because that's, that's a job that people are always hiring for. And then C, stick welding, for some reason, in our area, right here in Central Florida, pays predominantly more than anybody that can operate GMAW or gas tungsten. So if you're looking really? at MIG and TIG, you know, you're probably looking anywhere from 16 to 18. Most of the people that are requiring, you know, looking for stick welders, they're 18 to 22 an hour. So stick welding is still paying more. It's the hardest process to learn. We don't focus most of our time there, but I focus like for our level one program, I focus just as much time on stick as I do on MIG. And the funny mm-hmm. thing is, is once they learn how to stick weld in all four positions, I switch over to MIG welding and then boom, they just take off. And they don't need as much time in MIG because there's a reason they say it's so easy a monkey could do it. Or, you know, they call them MIG monkeys. It, it's an easier process to learn. But I, I always start off with stick. If you can learn stick, you can learn any other process. Because once you learn how to manipulate that puddle, everything else is going to transfer over into the other processes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I usually suggest that that they, you know, schools start off with stick welding as well, kind of for the same reason. Plus, the other thing about stick welding is it really um, is like humbling to learn because yep. it's, you know, really like if you just gave somebody a MIG welder and you're like, all right, here you go. And people be like, man, you know, like this is easy. And it's like, dude, like, wait, do you see like TIG welding or yeah. something, you know, like or trying to stick weld around a pipe or something like that? it's not necessarily you're not comparing apples apples it, it and also apples kind of or, separates you know, the people apples. you know like it separates the the wants from the not wants so the people that are coming into the program like like i said if you can learn stick you can learn any other process but some people get in there and be like man this welding thing's not for me and it's mm-hmm. it, it separates them really quick when you you know you put a stick electrode in their hands it kind of separates the people that that want to be there for to be a welder and those that don't um Stick welding is probably the hardest process to learn. So if you can master that one, and, and, and I, I use master loosely, if you can perform that process proficiently within 10 weeks, I can teach you any other project, any other process within two weeks. And stick welding, you know, I would say is probably also the one that you outside of a shop, you know, just anywhere, like mm-hmm. you're over at somebody's house, you know, they got a stick welder probably sitting in their shop someplace. And if you can fire up a stick welder and an old dusty hood and be able to lay down some beads, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Like I, I still stick weld stuff all the time. Like, I mean, especially on heavy equipment, you got to get in and just do a, a repair. You want to weld a hook on something or weld a lifting eye on something or whatever. Stick welding is, um, it's just such a great skill to have. And it's I mean, especially portable. if you're, if you're good. Yeah. It's super portable and you don't need as much accessories. Like if I switch over to, to gas metal arc welding or, or gas tungsten, MIG, TIG, whatever, uh, I don't I don't need contact tips. I don't need diffusers. I don't need nozzles. I don't need gas. I don't need hoses. It's like I need a positive end and a negative end. And that, that positive end could very well be a pair of ice grips duct taped together. Like I've, I've had to do that before. Same thing with the negative, you know, <laughs> like I've I've gotten pretty crafty. All I have to do is complete that circuit and I can run a 7018 eighth inch with 125 amps and I'll be good to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, and it's just such an easy thing. I think that was like one of the biggest things, like when I was in, when I was in high school and I left high school welding class, you know, I focused a ton on stick welding and I really loved just being able to like know how to set a machine, like identify an electrode know how to set a machine and know how to run, you know, either a 70 series or 60 series electrode. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's pretty much what you're going to run into, but you know, it's like, Oh yeah, you went to welding school here. I'll check out this stick. Well, let's see what you got. And you can just like, you're like, all right, 115 amps, you know, whatever. Like 
I mean, I think that that's, uh, you know, something that you can take with you, take it to the bank. It's like the foundation. But, yeah. Foundation of yeah. welding. But I, I, you know, I agree with what you're saying, though, too, about, you know, like you really got to focus on, you know, asking your local sales rep what what, what, how much, you know, what, what's the ratio of wire to electrode or whatever, what kind of wires being yeah, sold what are you in this selling area? The most? That's a great, that's a great thing. I never thought to like, I mean, as an instructor, like you could ask your local sales rep, the person yeah. that brings your wire and gas to your school, um, what are they selling in this area? Yeah. And you know, that's a great way to, you know, to kind of shift the focus or, or make sure that your focus is your in the right place is in the right place. Yeah. And that was, that was one of the things. Cause I mean, like you can go out and talk to employers till you're blue in the face. But the funny thing is, is for every one employer that you talk to that you learn about, you know, what they do, how they do it. There's 10 companies out there that you have no idea what the hell they're doing. You know, I oh, learned yeah. about, I learned about new companies weekly in our area and it's like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to hit them all. So the easiest way to do it is talk to the distributors. Hey, what, what, what's the, the number one selling piece of equipment that you have? Uh, you know, going out the door oh, right yeah. now, what's, what's everybody else buying? Hey, maybe I should consider training my students on that. So they're familiar with the products. What's the number one mm -hmm. selling filler wire using, you know, maybe I should focus more on this process over that process. I mean, if you're, yeah. if you're preparing students to enter the workforce, talk, you talk to the distributors cause they have that information. Yeah. I mean, and that's what, um, that's what I like so much about my coworker, Brian, he's, he's, he hits another side of this industry that I don't necessarily like. I'm not in sales. Um, I'm in the I'm in a support role. My job is to support guys like Brian and make sure that that he gets the resources that he needs. Make sure that the customers get the resources that they need. I'm not tied to the sales computer at all. I have no idea what pricing is in different areas because I cover, you know, thirty five thousand different customers across two states. You know, mm -hmm. we have hundreds of salespeople. Pricing set different all over the place. Um, my job is to support these guys, but these guys are the boots on the ground. They see what's going out on the tickets. They see, you know, whether the, the companies have frayed cables and poor ground clamps and what, you know, what companies are using, uh, different wires in different places. And as Brian's learning more about this, uh, certified welding supervisor thing, he's able to start seeing these things like deposition rate and seeing things like, man, I got this company that's doing structural steel and all they buy is oh three five like <laughs> yeah like like he's like and putting the pieces 25. together and yeah, he's like we should probably guess. go visit those guys you know and then he tees it up and it's like hey man i got this guy in town you know like or whatever and like i'll just go in and we'll just kind of have a conversation it's like hey man have you ever tried metal core and that's kind of what the mobile lab is going to be about like i'll have the lab with me and I'll be like do you want to try metal core right now yeah and they'd be like you know, okay. <laughs> and like you just hand them the machine. Here you go. Here's 045 metal core at 12 and a half pounds an hour. Oh, you want 9010? We got the little gas mixer in here. Here's some 9010 for you. Here's 8515. Here's, you know, you can just, that's the whole point of, uh, that's kind of the direction we're headed. That's, that's um, one thing I did want to pick your brain on and, and maybe not, yeah, not in this episode, but like just to kind yeah. of tee it up a little bit so you can get your, uh, get the creative juices flowing is I, I want to build a, a trailer, not necessarily yep. to sell product, but I want to figure out the best way to set it up, what I should run it off of. Essentially, I want to run roughly probably six or seven 200 amp MIG machines. And the whole idea is I want to hit up high schools and summer camps. Like we just had a summer camp over at the school and my brother or my buddy, uh, brother, brother from another mother, he's got a beard. So I'm sure we're related somehow. Um, Kyle Linko, he teaches up in PA at, up in the Scranton area and he does this dinosaur camp every year. So we had this, uh, this group of students that came in. He sent me the cut file for these dinosaurs. I cut out two four by eight sheets, eighth inch material, and we made these little dinosaur pieces. So like, I'm sure you've seen the little, um, like balsa wood. Yeah. Dinosaur like they're like kind of like yeah, pieced together just, and they, yeah, have, they just slip know. into one another. Well, we did that out of steel and taught the students for like day one welding safety you know, and then got them into the lab, did a little bit of welding, uh, day two cutting, well, cutting safety, uh, and then, you know, oxyacetylene cutting. And then day three and four was, you know, out there welding in the shop, assembling these dinosaurs. So what I would like to do is something a little bit more condensed, but mobile on a trailer and figure out exactly the best way to ergonomically set up this trailer to where 
it's efficient to train or teach or expose five to six people at a time with roughly two to three instructors, you know, so obviously we'll have a truck pulling this thing around two to three instructors on a weekend or whatever, and just kind of expose people to welding. If nothing more mm-hmm. than just to have a good time. Cause obviously, yep. I mean, we've, we've taught, I've been to different, uh, different events where, you know, I taught a bunch of like kids that were four to, you know, probably nine, you know, so, I mean, they're not even eligible to take my class, but I got to expose them to welding that day and it was cool. And I bought, oh, yeah. I bought one of the, the Lincoln electric airplanes that you can get through the JF Lincoln foundation. And I die chemed it. And I, I essentially, I stole their cut profile and I cut out a, you know, a sheet full of these airplanes and it, you know, but what I got to do with it is go out and show all these little kids how to weld for a day. And it was, it's like a really cool experience to see. It's like they built something with their own hands and the parents get all excited, but I want to build this little mobile welding lab to be able to go out and do that. So I wanted to pick your brain on like best power sources to put on there. What am I going to run, you know, sure. these machines off of, um, but I'd also like to have on the inside something where I could set it up to where, you know, I can show employers, hey, this is what we're doing in school. So obviously have like an advanced power wave in there, like 300C, so I can run yep. every single process on one machine. Um, you can run that power wave off of a, you can run that power wave, the 300 amp power wave, you can run off of Ranger 330 MPX. Okay. So I've got two of those. Um, I've, yep. I've run mine. I've run mine off of, uh, off of that. Um no problem at okay. 300, 308 amps along with running the trailer. Um, I'm going to, I'll leave you with this. This is like my, my, you, you're kind of touching on like what, what I'm like, my vision for the mobile lab is. I think the mobile lab is the welding rig of the future. Mm-hmm. You get guys like, you know, I will just use like Rush Kane as an example. So Rush Kane is, he's got his own machines. He has his own stuff, like his own tools, all his own stuff that he's invested in. He could put this inside of a trailer and then he could work for any company he wants. And all he needs is power. Yeah. He has, you know, let's say you have your own fume extraction, you have your own welder, you have your own, you, you could go to any gas supplier that you wanted. And the only thing that you require of your employer is just the place to plug it in. Um, so whether these are built out of, you know, shipping containers where you could ship it around the country. Um, but I think that building a mobile unit for, especially for someone that does like parts like TIG welding parts, uh, bench work, that type of thing. Um, or even like a bigger, you know, bigger structural steel type stuff. You could open the side of your shop up and you could have, you could have a hyper fill set up in there. Um, that to me, I think, um, has a lot of potential. Like, I think it, you know, if we want to start charging more as welders, um, because we've invested in our own tools and our own equipment, much like a rig welder does, this Mm -hmm. is why welding rigs, you, you know, they're like, Oh, you can make $300 an hour as a rig welder. Well, imagine what you could make if you had a full lab and a rig truck, like, like that would be, so I don't know. I think that, I think that you're on the right path with that. Um, my lab will probably be on the road in 30 days or less. Nice. Dude, you got to come down uh, to see my new school that we're putting together. I, dude. So here's, so here's you make it to Florida. You got to come. I, out. I would really, what I want to do is, um, as long as I cover my expenses to move it someplace, that's the plan is okay. to, you know, like a school or something like that. You could have me out like as a guest to the school. I take the rig and the lab out and then we do a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, I would, I've been working a lot with Lincoln on some different projects and Lincoln's going to sponsor some videos for YouTube, um, on their technology and on their things. Um, and that will build in the future. Um, my agreement with Lincoln is not exclusive, so I can use any company's brand, any, every, any different, uh, type of equipment I want. Okay. And I think that that's really important because, Lincoln doesn't, isn't the only company that makes great equipment. Right. Like I'll be the first to say that. Like I have a Miller tattoo for God's sake. Like, I see that. you know, I'm looking at an arrow wave right now. Like <laughs> everybody thinks I love Lincoln. Uh, but I also love Peronius. I also love OTC. Um, I would love to weld with a Kempe X eight. Like 
you know, my passion is for the industry, not any one particular brand. I just happen to have a really, really great relationship with Lincoln and I love the R and D end of what they do. Um, so in the near future, as things kind of start to simmer down a little bit, um, I'm going to start opening up my schedule to the mobile lab coming out, not trying to make a fortune on this stuff. It's really just about getting information out there, letting people that don't have a chance to play with a two-part gas mixer, that don't have a chance to play with a brand new power wave or hyperfill or any number of one of these processes and being able to get that out into the hands of the people um, and have somebody that understands how to run the piece of equipment there to like, you know, dial it in for you, essentially. I will tell you that if you're going up to Lincoln, there's two people you need to talk to while you're there. Well, there's okay. there's probably a couple. Charlie Cross. Okay. Go talk. If you haven't met Charlie Cross yet, you need to go talk to Charlie Cross because he's huge into Power Wave Manager. Um, he was sending me some stuff on Smart Pulse the other day because we got the 300 season, and I'm trying to get some technical data on Smart Pulse versus Precision you have the, Pulse. You have the new one? Yes. <clears throat> uh, I've got six of the new ones at my current school, and then... 10 of the new ones at the new school that we're going to, but oh, so jealous. There's I'm, so you got smart. I'm waiting, pulse. On, I'm waiting on mine. It's, it's coming. They're, they're freaking nice. You're, you're going to love it. The, um, but yeah, check so with, jealous. check Can't with Charlie. Charlie is like super brilliant on all that stuff. He's a CWI, CWE, CWS. He teaches CWI courses. He runs the power wave manager. I mean, he's, he's a data nerd. Just like, just like you are the other guy is uh, Charlie LaRitchie. Uh, hey. go, go talk to that dude. Super, super smart. Um, and he's one of the welding instructors at Lincoln. Very brilliant dude. Very cool. You got to talk to both of those. Tell them I sent you up there. Super great guys. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be there for a whole week next week. Okay. So um, I don't know when this podcast is coming out. It'll but, be on Monday. Uh, yeah, all Monday. of next week. Okay. So yeah, you'll be there the, the day that you land in Cleveland. Uh, this episode will be out because this it'll be out on the ninth. Nice. So if it's going to be out on the on the ninth, any questions that you have for anyone at Lincoln, if you want to know how something works and it's a red machine, I will be there. I'm going through all the like where they're putting the screws in the side of the machine, where they build these things. There are R and D labs, um, and I'm going to have my camera with me. I'm going to be doing. Um, we have a, I have a person that I'm working with directly on the marketing team to make sure that like the stuff that I film, like I will film as much as I'm allowed to film. There you go. Um, so my Instagram all next week is going to be, uh, all Lincoln stuff. And we're going to be talking about just about anything you can imagine, um, that they make and answering any questions that everybody has. I actually have a whole ton of questions about the Ranger, um, that people have sent me. And I'll be answering all those live on, or, you know, on my Instagram stories and stuff as well. Nice. I'm going to, I'm probably going to hit you up on that. I'm going to have to pin your highlights now. Yeah, please do. Yeah, please do. So I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, I will, I'll make the introduction. I'll shoot uh, Charlie an email and then I'll have okay, him yeah. kind of be on the lookout for you. And we'll, we'll kind of talk after this a little bit and I'll, I'll get you lined up with him because I reached out to him last week and he's telling me stuff about like, so I'm a member of AISC, uh, American Institute mm-hmm. of Steel Construction, but like I never get anything of value from them because it's a free membership. But he's like, oh, no, you need to look up this manual and this manual. So like I was like, all right, cool. So I, I just started Googling it, and as soon as I logged in, I had access to everything. And I was like, holy shit, I didn't even know that like my membership consisted of this, and I've been a member of AISC since, well, hell, as long as I've been a member of AWS. I just haven't taken advantage of anything because I, I never really got information on what's available. So right. he's super smart and yeah, send me yeah, in. send me his info and stuff. Like I got a I got a pretty full dance card when they uh, when the, all the engineers found out that I was coming. They're like, dude, he's coming. Like we get to do whatever we want. I'm like, yeah, man, we're gonna do like welding science stuff all week out there. Nice. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be fun. Like Ask especially him. since I've been cooped up for like a long time. See if you can sneak in. It's it's uh, it's hard to get him to do it, but if you can ask him to see uh, check out their their wire drawing facility for flux core out in Menor. Uh, I think it's okay. like 20, 30 minutes down the road. But yeah, they're they make enough wire in that facility to wrap around the Earth two and a half times per day. Damn. Think about that. Think about 
that's that's how much wire they're cranking out a day to wrap around the entire earth two and a half times per day yeah that's a lot and it's not sitting on a shelf i mean it's going out just as fast so like where's all that weld metal go there's a shit ton of welding being done in the u.s oh yeah oh yeah well i saw the when i was in troy ohio to get my CWS, I got to go see Hobart, you know, at the Hobart Institute, I got to go see Hobart's facility and stuff. I got to see okay. where, um, where they were making their stuff and the same kind of thing. I mean, it's very impressive. And yeah. then I got to see, um, Alco facility in Traverse city, Michigan, nice. uh, where they do all their aluminum mm-hmm. also really, really impressive. So yeah, I'm sure I'll try to, I'm sure I'll, I'll try to go see that, uh, how Lincoln does it as well. Yeah. If- if you're ever back in Troy, check out the guys over Select Arc too. They make oh yeah, they Select make, Arc's yeah, awesome. They're, they're right there in Troy. They make some badass wire. You gotta we get to tour their facility. It's pretty. I pretty like impressive. their metal. Their metal core is awesome. Their metal uh, core is freaking badass. Yeah, yeah, I like their metal core a lot. I've done a I've done a lot of um, I've done a lot with their metal core um for our customers. There's a lot of our customers, central customers that use that Select Arc that uh 70c there metal core, yeah that 70c metal core their their flux awesome core wire stuff. and well hell yeah all their flux core wire and uh their metal core wires like it's top notch mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's good stuff yeah buddy well hell Nate, i know well, you got a busy schedule i've got one as well uh we can go ahead and uh cut it short this this time i mean we're hitting a little over an hour and 45 minutes but it's been a pleasure having you on i look forward to you know watching your stories next week and when you get out to lincoln uh, go ahead, plug your social medias. Anything else you got coming up you want people to know about? We didn't even touch on Fabtech. Um, but yeah, we'll probably do one before then when we kind of know a little bit better. Yeah. Like I, I've I've been hearing some things and it looks like with everything um, with the new variant and stuff, like there's going to be some changes and stuff. So, man, I'm just like at this point, I'm just like, please just have the event. Yeah, please. just like, let it happen. Dude, they just oh, had Lollapalooza man. in Chicago. So if they can't say... We can't have Fabtech uh, because of COVID. Like, no, something else is going yeah. on. They just had Lollapalooza. In, what, it was in Chicago, right? The yeah. whole Fred Durst thing. Dude, I've seen pictures from it. It's insane. It's like Woodstock 94 all over again. And so yeah, if you, we're not if you tell us we can't Fabtech. have we just want to go look at some welders. Yeah, let me go look at some welding machines. Let me go check out the saws, the sheet metal brakes, talk out some of the electro yeah. manufacturers. I'll wear a mask. I'll be compliant. But, yeah, let me, let me go to yeah. Fabtech, damn it. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, so my social media, uh, at Weld Scientist, um, the second page that you should follow would be Central Welding on Instagram. Um, that's a collection of the best photos that I've ever taken of our customers out welding. That's at Central Welding. My coworker, Brian, is B-R-Y-A-N-B-541. Um, he covers uh, the area down in Southern Oregon. Also an aspiring photographer coming up in the industry definitely posts a lot of cool stuff and he builds boom boxes now as well so um yeah that's about it great we'll, we'll see you on the uh the next episode one one thing we got to do before we get out of here we got to get uh we got to call up mac from up and smoke and have him build you a white lab coat oh dude it's, uh, yeah i um okay yeah so I have to do some, I got to do these videos for Lincoln. I'll leave you with this, right? I'm doing these videos for Lincoln and stuff. And Lincoln's like, so, um, when you do these Lincoln videos, like you got to wear all Lincoln stuff. And I'm like, you guys, man. Cause like, usually I'm in all my normal, you know, like the stuff that I wear, I'm like, I'll wear some of the stuff. So I, um, I have these long Lincoln welding coats and that's what I'm going to wear the lab, long lab coats. I'm probably going to get one like embroidered on the back or something. Um, but yeah, I think the lab coat is the move. Okay. Yeah. I got a buddy, Daryl Fisher that he, that's what he wears is the, the long, he teaches up in Canada and, uh, he wears a long lab coat when he teaches and stuff, but yeah, yeah. yeah you're going to be like Gambit cool. from, uh, X-Men, yeah, you know, exactly. that, like trench coat. There you go. Mm-hmm. Cool, man. It was great having you on once again. Um, have fun at Lincoln. I know you're going to have a blast. Uh, hit me up. You need to go to Hofbrau house down there in Cleveland um sliman's deli if you can get in there tell the guys at lincoln you want to go to sliman's one day you got to stand in the line um once they sell out they just shut the doors uh they're open for lunch and as soon as everything's gone they close the doors and then hit up the nice. uh the the brewer and the butcher another good place over there on ninth street uh downtown cleveland yeah i got a lot of awesome people out there that are like we're gonna take you here we're gonna take you there so i'm just like 
I'm I'm super excited. I'll uh, see you guys on the internet, I guess. All right. Take it easy, Nate. Later, brother. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this week's episode of the Arc Junkies Podcast. You can find me on Instagram at Arc Junkies Podcast. You can email me directly, show at arcjunkies.com. Don't forget to swing by arcjunkies.com for all the cool merchandise, hats, shirts, and hoodies to represent your favorite podcast. Thanks again for downloading, and until next time, make every well better than your last. We'll be right back.